Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, excellencies, esteemed panelists, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon and thank you for joining us for this technical session on pre-disaster recovery planning at the World Reconstruction Conference. My name is David McLaughlin Carr. I'm the new Regional Director for Asia Pacific with the United Nations Develop Development uh, Coordination Office. I'm very pleased to be here to moderate this session on what is an extremely important topic. And I would like to thank the organizers, UNDRR, UNDP, GFDRR, and IRP for the opportunity to have to moderate this discussion this afternoon. Decades of disaster recovery experience have shown us that recovery plans, policies, institutions, and financing <clears throat> take time to develop and implement. Similarly, we know that delays in recovery lead to greater welfare losses and often to worse recovery outcomes. The rush to recover and rebuild can lead to the recreation of risk, repeating the mistakes of the past, and to people being left behind. Pre-disaster recovery planning offers solutions that can address these challenges towards better, faster, and more equitable recovery outcomes. Pre-disaster recovery planning describes the development of recovery plans and policies, the building of knowledge and skills to support recovery, the establishment of coordination mechanisms capable of managing post-disaster recovery needs, the re procurement of recovery-related equipment and supplies, and many other actions that can snap into action when a disaster occurs. The benefits of PDRP are potentially significant, but unfortunately not widely practiced. They're often under-resourced, and too often this is due to a lack of awareness, knowledge, or misunderstanding. And we hope this afternoon, in this very brief one hour, to try and bridge this, this misunderstanding and this important subject. Today we have a terrific panel, um, and they will be joining us uh, very shortly. Um, but we will use them to share knowledge and experience about how together we can demonstrate the benefits of pre-disaster planning, sharing the kinds of recovery preparedness that our panelists have taken in their countries, uh, share their experience of planning and implementation, and importantly, how we can improve uptake and scaling and in my uh, function is to work with resonant coordinators across the UN system in all of the 35 Asia Pacific countries that are represented on how we can better implement uh, pre-disaster recovery planning in our work. Before we go to our panel, however, I'm honoured to welcome to this session His Excellency, Mr. Inia Soi uh, Rui Ratu, Minister for Agriculture, Rural and Maritime Development and National Disaster Management of the Republic of Fiji. Mr. Seiratu is a disaster risk reduction and climate champion. I'm very privileged to have him as the opening speaker today in this session. Your Excellency, please, I give you the floor. Thank you, David. The Director of uh, Cabinet Office of Japan, Government of the Philippines, Department of Science and Technology Under Secretary, World Bank uh, Senior Disaster Risk uh, Management Specialist, Government of the Republic of Cabo, uh, Recovery Project Coordinator, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, uh, Nisambul Venaka, and a very good afternoon to you all. I'm very pleased to be here to address you on this distinguished forum today with emphasis on pre-disaster recovery planning. This is critical as pre-disaster recovery planning ensures that an affected community is ready to undertake an organized process and does not miss opportunities to rebuild in a sustainable and resilient way. It is no exaggeration to say that there are no few parts of the world that have uh, so acutely felt the brunt of climate change and disaster more, more severely than the Pacific region. While Fiji remains one of the world's most small, uh, smallest contributors to world carbon emissions, uh, the closely linked hazards of disasters and climate change are a major barrier to sustainable development, livelihoods, and food security. Ladies and gentlemen, the annual economic losses due to disasters in the Pacific small island developing states 
for the PCs are more than double the previous estimates. Uh, at US $1 billion or nearly 5% of the combined GDP for the Pacific Seeds. Fiji has uh, progressed well in our recovery preparedness and planning efforts through ongoing investments in the public and private sectors in mainstreaming disaster risk reduction principles into our policies, plans, programs, and projects. Fiji, through the National Disaster Management Plan, has a strong and well-supported structure that prevailed during disaster operations, which includes pre-disaster recovery planning. This is an integrated and inclusive approach that involves all actors at the national and subnational levels, including civil society, business leaders, faith-based organizations, and our communities. Local leaderships and capacities at subnational levels are key elements of the disaster recovery. These are embodied in the disaster management structures and plans which contribute to the national framework designed to support effective recovery in disaster impacted communities. One of the key challenges in post disaster recovery is access to disaster risk financing. The lack of available financing is a critical factor in delaying the start of recovery. Access to adequate finance early, recover, early in the recovery determines our ability to deliver on our recovery objectives and developmental plans. With the right support and access to finance, countries can indeed emerge stronger and more capable of seizing new opportunities. This access to finance is essential to protect the nation's well-being and serves to shape the outcome of recovery initiatives in sustaining our blue economy. Standard setting is critical for the success of recovery planning. Fiji has strengthened building standards for recovery projects. Following the devastation from tropical cyclone Winston in 2016, 32 schools were rebuilt to more resilient standards. These schools were again in the path of another Category 5 cyclone, Yasa, in 2020, but required only limited repairs and were functioning within weeks. The integration of DRR and climate change adaptation is also a critical challenge. There is a need to break down the silos that exist around action on disaster risks and climate risks with particular emphasis on the links between disaster risk management and climate change adaptation policies. Ladies and gentlemen, Fiji is also strengthening the governance arrangements at the local and community levels by formalizing disaster risk management committees to support pre-disaster recovery planning. These levels include traditional authorities, community-based organizations, higher education institutions, cultural groups, non-governmental non organizations, faith-based organizations, and private sector entities that play various roles in planning for recovery. This is done with the aim to empower and increase participation of local leaders in utilizing their knowledge and experience in disaster management activities, thereby strengthening risk reduction in recovery at all levels. One of our recovery measures that have shown better recovery outcomes in our ongoing efforts to strengthen governance and uh, regulatory framework. This includes the formulation and review of our policies, legislations, and partnerships. Our Fiji's National Disaster Risk Reduction Policy for the years 2018 to 2030 enables delivery of priorities for reducing and preventing new disaster risks. Our whole of government and whole of society approaches to recovery planning makes it imperative that DRR does not remain centralized, but ensuring engagement and participation of all stakeholders and communities at all levels. In Fiji's context, we work to strengthen our inclusive approaches at every level to improve recovery preparedness and readiness. Sorry. We were able to manage multifaceted emergencies through a whole of society approach. I'm glad to share that Fiji's success in managing response before and during disasters is a result of strong government-led coordinated mechanisms. 
and critical to these efforts are the partnerships established with our stakeholders, including civil society organizations. A scaled-up cooperation and coordination with our civil society is to enhance community-level prevention, preparedness, and response measures to manage and the simultaneous disasters. This is achieved through our ongoing efforts in strengthening governance arrangements, making sure that civil society organizations play a key role in decision making. Additionally, cash-based assistance targeting the most vulnerable communities and individuals are increasingly, increasingly used in the context of large-scale disaster preparedness. Fiji is advancing towards a better utilization of geographical information systems and online data collection platforms. These initiatives focused on development of multi-sectoral assessment forms in an online platform with an inclusion of gender, age and disability, disaggregated data. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I leave you with the three basic principles. With these three basic principles, as we examine various best practices on pre-disaster recovery planning. First, any potential solutions we embrace must be transformative. They must be able to make a real difference and be a game changer. Second, they must also be practical and affordable, enough to be embraced on a greater scale, so that something that works in Fiji or in other countries for that matter should, uh, should also work across the globe. And finally, they must be able to be replicated. Something innovative that happens in one community can also happen in communities across the region. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency, for that um, that wonderful expose of the preparedness uh, measures that have been taken in Fiji. Um, and as you've pointed out, disasters disproportionately affect the small island developing states, and of which Fiji has a leading role in, in the Pacific, but also in the wider region itself. And so the experience that we have from Fiji is, you know, of a, of a country that's, a, that's applying these three principles, as you said, the transformative policies, practical and affordable, and can be replicated. So I think um, the idea of, of this panel and, and working with our uh, partners is the replicability to be able to share the, the practices, best practices and learning experiences from across the region. I think you've also pointed to a very important f point about the lack of financing, of course, which is um, if a climate mitigation is always a challenge. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be this uh, financing. How do we mobilise partners, including perhaps the private sector, which you touched upon, but perhaps you might, um, are there any examples in the Fiji context where the government is working hand in hand with the private sector on preventative uh, measures for, for, for disaster management? I wonder whether you could elaborate perhaps on that point. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, thank you, David, for that question. Yes, we do. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, we learned a lot uh, after Cyclone Winston. Uh, in fact, that really changed, changed our, our paradigm. Uh, particularly our development paradigm. Uh, the three key elements after Winston is resilience. Resilience must be at the core of every development that we do. Let's not just do development for the sake of having development. But of course, resilience must be at its core. Two, sustainability. It must last. So sustainability is important. And of course, humanitarian principles. Uh, therefore, I've talked about the 32 schools. The Fiji Institute of Engineers came on board. Uh, that was post-cyclone Winston. Without uh, any cost to government, they put their hands and brains together, did all the assessments, not only in terms of school, but our other infrastructures as well, volunteered their time. They came up with the new designs and whatever, at no cost to government so that we can work towards this resilience. So the private sector, and of course, through the Fiji Employers Federation, uh, they also have a committee that works with uh, uh, um, our NDMO office and uh, uh, the, uh, the government team at the Ministry of Economy to ensure that, uh, so we do 
the role of the private sector is very, very critical, and we have that uh, arrangements in place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And um, on behalf of everybody in the room, we wish to thank the Honourable Minister for contributing to this session. Uh, and I would like now, with, uh, with your permission, Excellency, now to transition uh, to our panel, which will now come up to the, uh, to the floor. So thank you very much, Excellency. Thank you, Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an extraordinary panel with us today, representing four countries uh, and their experiences with pre-disaster recovery planning. We're also privileged to have a distinguished discussant to give us a regional perspective from the Americas and the Caribbean. I'd like to start us off with the experience of the United States of America, a long-standing practitioner of pre-disaster recovery planning. Our first speaker is Ms. Cynthia uh, Spishak. I think she's here with us. She's on video, right? who is the Associate Administrator of the Office of Policy and Program Analysis at FEMA, where she leads on strategic and resource planning, data analy an uh, analytics, policy audit, and international affairs functions. Due to the time difference, uh, we are unable to have her here uh, live, but we are very pleased to present a video message from her, and we'll now pass to that directly, and uh, we will then bring the panel up. So over to Ms. Bishak. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss this important topic. My name is Cynthia Spishak, and I serve as the Associate Administrator for Policy, Program Analysis, and International Affairs within the United States Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. It is an honor to be part of the World Reconstruction Conference and represent FEMA at this esteemed forum for the first time. Today, I will be sharing some best practices on preparedness and pre-disaster recovery in the United States, and I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists about your approaches. We see the most successful recovery from disasters where we have established relationships with communities and the opportunity to consider the unique aspects of each community when engaging in pre-disaster recovery planning. As you well know, working to establish trusted relationships in a post-disaster environment is difficult and ad hoc recovery efforts can result in delays in stabilizing an impacted community. One best practice FEMA utilizes is providing permanent local recovery advisors that communities can work with to conduct long-term planning and develop disaster recovery plans and frameworks before a disaster. This support for community leaders and practitioners helps establish and strengthen relationships and provides the opportunity to deliver a tailored recovery plan that considers their unique needs and resources. This collaborative work includes considering recovery roles, responsibilities, and capabilities, and identifies priorities and activities that are realistic, planned, and communicated in advance of a disaster. I understand that this is easier said than done. Planning takes time, and in many communities, perhaps as some of you experience, it is one of many responsibilities for a small team or maybe even one person. We are continuing to explore ways to best support and enable these efforts, which will ultimately lead to successful community disaster recovery as well as address gaps in steady state environments. And successful recovery outcomes depend on the principles of preparedness, mitigation, sustainability, and resilience. As we put our planning into practice, we want communities to recover faster and be more resilient, and in a way that considers diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Where we bring recovery and planning expertise, the context of what the community needs for all of its members is critical to the success of planning and achieving equitable outcomes. A one-size-fits-all approach does not work. Another best practice for pre-disaster planning and sustainable recovery is considering the integration of climate adaptation, economic development, and capital improvement plans that are tailored to a community. These plans can be complementary and can help communities build back stronger and more resilient. Similarly, 
this planning integration must carry forward into other community resilience or hazard mitigation planning post-disaster. For example, pre-identified sustainable construction presents new opportunities for communities. While we may not always be the experts, we have the ability to convene the experts to provide technical assistance from the whole community, a range of partners from other agencies, faith-based and nonprofit entities. There are plenty of examples of how this has paid off, including shortening timelines associated with rebuilding critical infrastructure, even from a 20-year timeline to a five-year timeline in some cases, and resulting in longer-term sustainability for the community. We should think about these opportunities across sectors, such as energy, transportation, and public health. The final best practice I'd like to highlight is thinking about scalability as part of pre-disaster planning. As I already mentioned, I recognize that community emergency managers and planners are managing significant day-to-day -day responsibilities, making pre-disaster planning challenging. This can be exacerbated by the influx of resources and requirements post-disaster. Thinking about how the community could quickly scale up to receive and apply grants and technical assistance in the event of a disaster will reduce delays in recovery. Having clear priorities and the ability to meet the incoming support, whether it's personnel or resources, will produce confidence and demonstrate leadership across the community. Ultimately, the pre-disaster planning will also improve our ability to withstand disasters too. As the landscape of hazards becomes more complex and interrelated, so must our planning to consider future conditions, not just those of previous years or even just today. We are continuously learning and evaluating our approaches to plan for and recover from disasters so we can apply what we learn from each engagement and event. I hope some of these insights resonate with you and I look forward to hearing the remarks from my fellow panelists. Thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts. All right. Let me thank um, Ms. Bishak very much from, from, from FEMA for her very insightful commentary. And now I'd like to turn to the first member of our distinguished uh, panels um, today, and he's from the government of Japan. Uh, let me introduce Mr. Takeo uh, Murakami, who's the Director of International Cooperation Division Disaster Management Bureau in the Cabinet Office of Japan. Uh, Mr. Murakami has extensive experience in disaster management, having previously held roles in the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism, but also work with UN OCHA and UNDRR. He's also currently the co-chair of the International Recovery Platform of the Steering Committee. Mr. Murakami, please go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for introducing myself. Um, Thank you for having me in this very important session. As Japan has been a long-standing supporter of the International Recovery Platform, I am delighted to join this session on the Fifth World Reconstruction Conference and promote Build Back Better agenda of the Sendai from Framework Priority 4. Uh, can you show the slide? Yes, thank you. Uh, next, please. Today, I'd like to touch on Japan's experience on pre-disaster recovery planning, or PDRP. First, I go through some recent policy developments at the national level, and then provide you with a couple of practical examples on the ground. Next slide, please. At the national level, Cabinet Office developed a handbook on recovery for use by local governments. The latest version was published in 2021. The, the handbook covers all aspects of recovery measures needed for local governments. It actually covers 18 policy areas in 64 sub-areas. Next slide, please. As a companion to the handbook, Cabinet Office also maintains a database of local recovery practices against uh, past disasters. The database now covers 718 cases from 54 disasters dating back to 1959 Isewan Typhoon. Next slide, please. The Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport, or MLIT, is responsible for city planning, and in this connection, the Ministry developed a pre-disaster planning guideline for city reconstruction in 2018. The guideline identifies five necessary measures for PDRP, which are to, one, prepare institutional arrangement, two, prepare steps and timelines, three, conduct reconstruction exercises, four, collect and analyze basic data in advance, and five, prepare reconstruction goals. Next slide, please. Based on the guideline, the ministry conducts follow-up surveys to capture the progress made by local governments. 
According to the latest result, out of over 107,000, sorry, 1,700 local governments, more than 60% have started some sort of pre disaster planning. Next slide, please. Here, I would like to highlight the importance of linking PDRP with disaster risk reduction measures by local governments. The figure shown here, which is a bit small, is taken from MRIT's guideline. It emphasizes that PDRP coexists with DR measures. Both of them are indispensable elements for achieving Build Back Better. And what is more important is that PDRP and DR measures are and should be mutually complementary. Let me give you an example on the ground. Next slide, please. There is a small town called Taiji in the southernmost part of Wakayama Prefecture in Japan. The town is located in the region that shall be hit by a large earthquake and tsunami called Nankai Trough Earthquake. It is anticipated that such an earthquake and tsunami will occur with 70 to 80 percent probability within coming 30 years. As a response, the town recently developed its own pre-disaster recovery plan and revised its town master plan. The picture shown here is taken from the town's pre-disaster recovery plan. It shows the town's vision for reconstruction after a tsunami hit the coast. The town intends to cut the soil on the hillside areas and use the soil to embank coastal areas so that the elevated residential zones will be secured against future tsunamis. Next slide, please. The significance of Taiji Town's plans is that the pre-disaster recovery plan is interlinked with the town master plan. The town master plan envisions future land use of 20 years ahead and start developing roads for future residential zones. But it takes time to achieve the goals due to fiscal constraints because it is a very small town. Once the disaster strikes, the reconstruction process should be facilitated, and the master plan's goals can be achieved earlier. This is the idea of linking PDRP with town master plan. Next slide, please. I will give you another example here. The previous example was about an earthquake and tsunami, but this example is climate-related hazard. And I would like to mention that this is an effort to which I was personally involved in my previous position. There is a large river called Gonokawa that runs across Hiroshima and Shimane prefectures in the western part of Japan. Due probably to the impact of climate change, the river basin in the Shimane prefecture side was hit by floods three times in four consecutive years. Next slide, please. As a result, the region developed a river basin master plan for flood control and city planning. This was joint effort by four local municipalities the prefectural government, and the national government. The idea of the plan is shown on the picture. Because of its geographical setting, it is technically very difficult to build levees along the river on the limited land. On the other hand, the population of the region is declining rapidly. We envisioned a smart shrink concept and promoted the consolidation of small settlements. In doing so, the region can reduce flood risk in a shorter period of time and therefore the population decline can be suspended. The project is still ongoing, and individual district plans should be developed. But if successful, this can be a model for PDRP and DRR in areas with declining population all across the country. Next slide, please. To summarize my presentation, there are several local governments in Japan that are de dealing with PDRP against anticipated large earthquake and tsunamis. In addition, PDRP efforts against climate-related hazards have started in part of Japan. What I wanted to emphasize is the complementarity between PDRP and DRR. And finally, national government plays important roles, such as by providing guidelines, compiling database, and facilitating coordination. Well, that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you. Come here. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Murakami, who's given us a very rich, I think, uh, examples of, of Japan's uh, vast experience in disaster management. But I, I think you very uh, ably demonstrated the link between pre-disaster preparedness planning and disaster response, which I think is really, really important. Uh, it can never start too early. 
And as you've given the example, particularly in Taiji Town, uh, this is something that uh, has been also mainstreamed into local develop local development plans, which is, uh, I think, what what we're looking for. And thank you very much for respecting the time limit. If I may just remind our panelists, um, we have a maximum allocation of seven minutes, and uh, I'd ask you to kindly keep to that just so we can stay on time. Um, and now I'd like to turn to the experience also in another country that is very much uh, prone to natural disaster, uh, which is the Republic of the Philippines. And we're joined today by two distinguished speakers who will make a joint presentation. Uh, Mr. Renato Solidum Jr. Uh, is the Under Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology of the Philippines uh, since March 2017, uh, where, among other responsibility, he spearheads the department's disaster risk reduction and climate change related undertakings. He also current, concurrently serves as the officer in charge of the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology. And he will present today with Ms. Leslie Cordero who is the Senior Disaster Risk Management Specialist at the World Bank, based in Singapore. Ms. Cordero leads work on innovative policies and instruments such as recovery frameworks, emergency cash transfers, and adaptive social protection measures, resilient infrastructure programs, catastrophe risk insurance, and the contingent credit facilities for disaster. Uh, and now I would like to please pass the floor to Under Secretary uh, Solidum and Ms. Cordero for their presentation. Thank you very much, David, and truly a wonderful experience to be part of this conversation. So allow us to share our slide. The title of our joint presentation the Philippines is Ready to Rebuild, Planning Smart for Disaster Rehabilitation and Recovery. And this next slide would show you the risk profile of the Philippines. And the photos would give you a glimpse of the level of devastation and impact of disasters. But the real story behind that is not just the impact and the number of people who died and the damage to property, but it is how long it will take to recover and how many people are affected in terms of development. But compound shocks of the pandemic and climate change amplify the impact of natural disasters. So we need to do a better job in trying to evolve with the different disasters and how to manage compound shocks. So for the Philippines, this next slide would show you that the Philippine Disaster Council has a flagship program and it is a capacity building program that is spearheaded by the Office of Civil Defense, the Department of Science and Technology, the planning office, as well as the local government units and interior and local government. It is highlighting pre-disaster recovery preparedness at the national, regional, and local levels. When you look at this, you can see that different local government units signed up to participate in pre-disaster recovery planning activities. And this was done over a period of one year. And this was at the height of the pandemic. So when we were ready to do face-to-face -face training sessions, we had to immediately and quickly convert it into a virtual session and the challenges of internet connectivity, COVID restrictions, as well as the other disasters that constantly affect the Philippines are there. So the next slide would show you that aside from 250 local government units, provinces, cities, and municipalities who participated, you are looking at 1,200 local chief executives mayors, governors, the RM officers, and technical staff who have increased their capacity to recover faster, better, and more resiliently, even before disasters happen. Your questions right now would be, can we do this in our respective countries? We have seen the example of the minister from Fiji who shared the example of Fiji, and the answer is yes. And I'm sure in the different Caribbean and African countries, you can also do it. But the question is, how will you start? Having a playbook, having a pre-approved disaster recovery framework would help. Looking at various institutions and setting up the institution even before a disaster happened. Thirdly, highlighting the importance of pre-disaster baseline data is crucial. Looking at technology to be able to maximize the use of this pre-disaster baseline data, as well as defining local, recovery financing strategies. 
that we can already tap even before the disasters happen. So the next slide will show you that these are not stories from the World Bank or the, from the Philippine government, but you can hear insights from the different participants. And let me show you the video. yung pinaka-importante is yung nung in-emphasize dun sa first few sessions namin na importante yung baseline data, yung preparation, yung planning na po. Sa this training po, nakita namin yung iba-ibang financing strategies. Wala po kasi akong narinig o nabalitaan na parang yung gusto pa focus po na program or capacity building is focuses on uh, recovery and habitation. The Ready to Rebuild program has really helped us look at disaster preparedness and recovery in a different perspective. It's a change of mindset that, yes, we should be ready for any eventuality, but in the end, we know what to do. We are in control and we know where we are going. The next slide will show you that the goal is not just to keep everything, all the resources in the Philippines, but to share it and to have the data as well as the information and materials accessible. So the Disaster Council, the Office of Civil Defense, and the Department of Science and Technology has taken ownership over the program and created a web page of the Ready to Rebuild program and plugged it in in the main website of the Disaster Council. The web page also has a resources section specifically dedicated for uh, they're ready to rebuild. Videos are streamed in Facebook pages with a combined following of almost half a million. And the Philippine DRM program is also featured regionally and globally with, through the GFDRR newsletters, as well as World Bank Tokyo's DRM hub. And this platform allows us to share more insights on pre-disaster recovery planning to a wider audience. The next slide would show you that you don't just stop at pre-disaster recovery planning. You also try to see how you can plug in pre-disaster baseline data sets. And we did a science-based disaster planning training session spearheaded by Undersecretary Solidum himself. So let me transition our presentation to USEC Solidum. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Leslie. Next slide, please. To further assist local governments in developing their disaster plans, recovery plans, Using science-based information and help national governments manage the effort, the Department of Science and Technology, in collaboration with the World Bank, has developed the Plan Smart app. Next slide, please. The Plan Smart application um, essentially has developed an automated systematic planning tool using the Ready to Rebuild workbook by introducing integrative approaches to manage pre-disaster and post-disaster data by leveraging the GRS Philippines integrated platform and using a pro forma template of the planning document. Next slide, please. The GRS Philippines Initiative is a multi-agency effort led by DOST that developed a central source of information for hazards and risk assessments for resilience to natural hazards and climate change. It is both an ICT and geospatial platform to promote use of digital technology for access and analysis of data and a governance platform to spur collaboration among sectors in a transparent, systematic, and efficient manner. Next slide. Through this initiative, we have addressed major challenges in risk assessment by streamlining processes, developing data standards and codes, providing free online analytical platforms, communicate hazards, and strengthen national and local governments in their planning efforts. Several applications have been developed, including the GeoMapper, Hazard Hunter, GeoAnalytics, and PlanSmart. Next slide, please. The GeoMapper is available both for mobile and desktop gadgets, would empower local governments and national agencies to populate a nationally consistent exposure database. Next slide. The Hazard Hunter enables multi-hazard assessment of a point or polygon area with a report in an easy and quick manner in less than a minute. It allows overlaying of hazard maps and exposure data. This is publicly available, both available in mobile and desktop. Next slide, please. The Geoanalytics um, app generates hazard, summary hazards assessments through graphs, tables, and maps of political units from village to provincial level. It looks into exposure to hazard of the land demographics like population, sex, and ages, and other critical facilities and other elements that can be considered. 
Next slide. The streamlining process will be done through the Plan Smart as it auto generates rehabilitation and recovery plans using pro forma documents, access nationally consistent hazard information, and LGU scale exposure data, auto generate hazard assessment using the GeoRisk app for pre and post disaster data, enable input of areas affected by actual events, and manage routing mechanism on verification and submission plan. Next slide. Once there is a large scale event, the plan is triggered through the input of event name in the app, which would enable national agencies and local governments to input data and start the planning process. The plan and funding requirement will undergo verification by key government agencies, which will then be submitted to the Council for approval. Next slide. The planning tool is a web application customized to be user-friendly, and it, uh, data are generated by national and local governments and methods developed in the project are integrated in the app. Users can log in using their account, after which they can start creating their plan. They can edit their work through the Manage Plan menu. Next slide. Pre-disaster hazard maps and graphs will automatically be generated by the app as the user enters the name of the town, city, or the province, or the village. Post-disaster maps will be shared automatically from the national government agencies and local governments. Next slide. After the hazard impact analysis, the users can develop and enter appropriate interventions that are um, downloadable and downdraft. These action plans will then be indicated in the pro forma planning documents by the app, and you push a button and the report will be presented. So we have shared with you the, uh, uh, the process and the applications that we have uh, prepared, and I hope that you can learn from us. And if you want to learn, from the, uh, uh, learn the system, then please uh, talk to us. Thank you very much. I'd like to sincerely thank Mr. Solinam and Ms. Cordero for this really uh, interesting and innovative program. And uh, I think we have a lot to learn from this, and I look further, uh, forward to further discussion on the subject. I, I like very much the theme that was presented of empowering local communities. Um, I'm a firm believer that it needs to start at a grassroots level, the planning, uh, in order to make communities more resilient. You've also highlighted, I think, the very important uh, collaboration with the World Bank. Uh, and I would also suggest that at the level of the UN country teams, um, the work on mainstreaming in our cooperation frameworks of this kind of uh, innovation would be very, very important and very welcome. So we will continue the collaboration. But thank you again very much. I'd now like to welcome our last speaker on the panel, uh, Mr. Jeremias Cabral. Uh, Mr. Cabral uh, hails from Cabo Verde where he serves as the Risk Director of the National Civil Protection and Fire Service. Uh, Mr. Cabral, I yield the floor to you for your presentation, and great to have uh, Cape Verde here with us. Thank you. Um, I, I, this is an uh, experience sharing the implementation of the project, Building Capacity for uh, Resilience Recovery, Phase 2, uh, funded by Grand Duce Luxembourg, and uh, through UNDP. Show the slide, please. Uh, next. Uh, in the second phase of the project, uh, we pre prioritized the preparation in the sector and local government and to better manage and recover process in an effective, sustainable, and inclusive way strengthening capacity and system to for better planning and management and the recovery process in order to increase the resilience of the country uh, and community in the face of disaster and the, the rap rapid return to sustainable uh, development. Uh, we review the, of the legal framework and the institutional mechanisms for post-disaster recovery Disaster recovery proportion designed to review DRR legislation and uh, to improve legal arrangement and institutional mechanism for post disaster recovery. We promote meeting with all the entities that work in DRR and the emergency response in order to train them uh, so they uh, to identify the sector legislation if everything that has to to which DRR and rep response. We identify uh, that in the sectorial legislation, 
there was an overlap of power between some entity. We identified the need for the compilation of the law uh, referring due to disaster risk reduction and post-disaster recovery in order to facilitate consultation, training, and rapid sharing. Uh, we uh, elaborate uh, and implement uh, of the communica communication strategy present action in the short, medium, and long term. We define five strategic acts. Uh, one, what are the risk, the risk and what are, are the different types of the risk we may to expose to and how to communicate at any time. Uh, the, two, what is the natural of the risk we are exposed to and what impact can they have on our life or, and the life of the community? Uh, and propose different ways to dissemination the resulted uh, at the central, regional, and local level. Uh, three, what to do to minimize the, the occurrence of disaster? How to believe, behave uh, in the emergency and during uh, the recovery process? Or what support mechanism exists? Uh, how they work and uh, what are they uh, limitation? The national strategy for disaster risk reduction. Uh, five, integration of the national disaster risk recovery strategy with the sustainable Deve development goals. We test the communication strategy during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and it worked very well. Uh, we develop uh, of national guidelines for disaster recovery. A decision support and pre preparing tool for disaster recovery, discussion and validation uh, workshop were held. We define what important, important information should be included in database, it will be created, uh, in order to enable uh, the definition of a pre-disaster baseline in the following sector, environmental, meteorology, education, agriculture, health, and um, health, and the transversal issue, including the gender. We prepare a collection chat that allow you to quickly define the post-disaster recovery needs in the following sector, uh, health, uh, education, agriculture, infrastructure, water, and sanitation job. And, uh, uh, this phase uh, of the project, we cre create the National Disaster Observatory which aims to improve all historical records of the disaster into national database, reporting to assessment of damage and the associated laws. Uh, has mechanism uh, of to support the process of identifying uh, post-disaster recovery needs. Several training were implemented for the project techniques and the, the civil protection, the management of the observatory. A gender-based uh, strategy and action plan were developed to ensure gender uh, main strategy in the post-disaster recovery proje project and strategy priority area seven, uh, resilience post-disaster recovery uh, uh, as part uh, of the National Strategy for Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, a training session was held the technician for the National Civil Protection Service and the, the uh, Ministry of Internal Administration. Uh, we the proposed for the legal diploma for on fire safety in the building was prepared. Increase resilience capacity in the response to disaster caused by urban and industrial fires. Training in, in the scope of uh, PDNA uh, methodology uh, in order to provide national technicians with knowledge and uh, on the methodology for preparing to post-disaster need assessment document in the training uh, to the topic of drone 
uh, was uh, for 42 na national techniques were trained. Uh, a disaster risk uh, guideline for the manual for the engineer and architect was development. Uh, in local level, uh, several socialization, dissemination, and training workshops were held on the national strategy for disaster risk reduction, post disaster uh, recovery framework, and the de uh, detailed assessment of urban risk uh, in C uh, six islands and, and ten municipality in the Cape Verde. Uh, the pilot workshop uh, in four uh, local, uh, local far from municipal center. Thank you. So, uh, muito obrigado, Senor Cabral, for that excellent uh, expose um, in Cabo Verde. And I think what you've pointed to, this incredibly important, is that communications, education, and training are a fundamental part of this. And all the best laid plans in the world can mean nothing unless they're disseminated and, and, and assimilated by the local population and understanding it. So thank you very much for that, showing, demonstrating the national level and, again, the local, as has our other speakers demonstrated. Um, I would now like to um, pass to uh, our, our distinguished discussant uh, today, Mr. Raul Salazar, uh, to share his reflections and contribute contribute to the discussion. Mr. Salazar is the Chief of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Secretariat for the Americas based in Panama. Uh, prior to this position, Mr. Salazar worked as Deputy Chief of Office in the UNDRR Regional Office for the Americas since 2011 and as Program Officer in UNDP. Uh, Mr. Salazar, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Thank you for the presentation. It's always very interesting to know how we can contribute further in this uh, process of pre-disaster recovery planning. Uh, one of the things that I would like to start with is uh, just to bring some perspectives from the Americas and the Caribbean and what is happening there. Basically, one of the things that is highlighted by the Sendai framework as one of the main pillars is uh, how the um, the having an effective recovery governance mechanism is an opportunity for building back better. And in this sense, having these plans in place working before is an opportunity to support the communities in achieving resilience. In the Caribbean, uh, there is a, a, a study that was launched in 2020 that showed how the recovery models adopted in the Caribbean are basically ad hoc models, ad hoc institutions that are designed to manage and lead the recovery processes as a way of accelerating activities for rehabilitation or to solve different bottlenecks that appear when this happens and then have support to overcome sometimes bureaucratic delays. The experience in Dominica and the British Berlin Islands with the hurricanes Irma and Maria also show that not only is enough to develop these ad hoc mechanisms, but in parallel to the processes uh, that are in place when we are starting these recovery processes, to also consider the uh, strengthening of the capacity of the national institutions, sectoral institutions, to carry out the process as much as, they, as, as, as uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Murakami pointed out. One of the things that also has been happening in the Caribbean is that having realized this need of strengthening the capacities for national and sectoral capacities, is uh, they have launched recently the Caribbean Resilient Recovery Facility as a way to provide this capacity building at the uh, small island development states level. On the side of the Latin American countries, this is a region that is, uh, has a high impact of disaster that have led to a greater emphasis in the recovery processes that have led to longer-term disaster resilience uh, initiatives. In this case, for example, one of the things that we have been seeing recently is how these recovery processes are oriented to building financial, financial resilience. We have seen, for example, how the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank and other institutions have been setting uh, what they call the financial uh, disaster, disaster finance strategies 
for resilience that are basically these uh, uh, mechanisms for risk transfer or catastrophic bonds or in this case um, a contingency funding. So this is what is happening in Latin America and also Central America has other type of approaches. Basically what they are doing now is uh, developing the regional capacities at the, at the intergovernmental organization level to provide support to integrate these uh, initiatives at the national level in terms in forms of local national plans for recovery. And we have seen these experiences in Panama and El Salvador, Honduras, and, and, and in Nicaragua. I would like to just stop here and then uh, on having these uh, previous representations to bring some uh, questions to the panelists. And because I think that thinking about uh, governance and what we have seen at least in, in the Americas and the Caribbean are basically uh, approaches that are calling, uh, refer to, to the natural hazards. What we have usually seen as natural hazards, uh, the, the experiences that we have faced, for example, in the region related to climate, basically climate hazards, have led that these mechanisms of pre-disaster recovery planning are oriented to either to hurricanes or in this case geological for earthquakes. But my question to the panelists, and I would like to, to just give this, um, this gives the remaining uh, space for, for your response is, how did COVID-19 pandemic challenge the existing pre-disaster recovery planning mechanisms that are in place? And I would like to just pose this question to you. And the second question that I would like to pose to the panel is basically how can the communities and other stakeholders can be meaningful engaged in this process. We have seen in the tape, for example, of biological hazards, how this particular disaster has impacted the vulnerable populations. Natural hazards too. But this combination and complexity of risks that we are facing now, uh, we are going to face in the future, also raise the level of response and the risk governance recovery capacities that we'll need to think of. So I would like to just to hear your reflections on that. It's an open question to each of the panelists. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Raul. Um, so we have two questions. Uh, the impact of COVID, how has it changed our disaster planning and pre-disaster preparedness? And, uh, and the, how, how to better engage communities in, in, in our uh, pre-disaster um, preparedness planning? Um, so May I invite the panelists, who, in no particular order, uh, to perhaps address these questions? Who would like to start? I, thank you. From the Philippines. I'll start with the second question, which is more easy. <laughs> Essentially, what we need is to make sure that everyone from the top level of government and down to the individuals and families would need to have an understanding of the impact of the natural hazards or the disasters that can happen to them. I call that disaster imagination. And that can be done through science-based uh, hazards and risk assessment. And that is why we develop the GRS Philippines Initiative so that everyone can actually use the platform to be able to determine the hazards and the possible impacts that they can be affected with. That is very powerful because if you know that you will die because of a certain hazard, for sure you will do something about it. The more difficult uh, question is on COVID because uh, this is the first time I think for, many, for all countries to handle such kind of a global pandemic. And I think uh, with, with the two years that has happened, uh, we, uh, we realized that we can actually apply the same principle in disaster management to COVID. But uh, uh, this uh, has really uh, been a, a work in progress always, right? Because uh, the tendency, for example, in our country would be to uh, have a lockdown or um, isolate uh, communities and people so that the economy has been affected by it. When it comes to natural hazards, um, we can actually look into the lesson from COVID and convince people to prepare for extreme natural events. Because in COVID, you have many deaths, but the big difference between extreme natural hazards is that there is no physical damage to many important infrastructures that we have. So when I talk about preparing for natural hazards, we can learn from the recent experience. We need to prepare for the physical damage because it will impact in a greater manner than COVID in a very short period of time. Thank you. 
Ayan. Let me add what uh, Yusak Rina mentioned. I think all of us here in this room and connected have witnessed three things with COVID pandemic. And it has challenged us in several different ways. One, the overwhelmed systems. Our emergency response is up to their neck in terms of the different departments, the different local government units, the different agencies responding for a natural hazard, a COVID pandemic, a climate risk, and even in some countries, human-induced disasters. Second, the reality of limited resources. The fiscal space is this small. And when you ask from your department or Ministry of Finance and Department of Budget and Management for more money because you want to deal with disasters, you want to deal with COVID recovery or even the impact of COVID, the answer is we could not provide any. So how do you manage that? What type of disaster imagination can you help national government agencies, ministries, and local government units anticipate, assess, right? And finally, how do you bring in the vulnerable sector? And how do you make sure that they are not left behind? So these are the three things that we have experienced, and I'm sure what Secretary, uh, what Yusek Solido mentioned and what most of the countries here are grappling with is how fast can we evolve and how do we address this using existing institutions and quickly customizing something that would help respond and recover. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Murakami. Yeah, well, the time is limited. I try to answer both questions at once. <laughs> um, uh, in my presentation, I, sh I showed the example of the town of Taiji, and the, the town was very keen to develop a new plan for the pre-disaster recovery planning. The reason why that the community is very much engaged is that there is a evidence, a science science-based evidence of future earthquake and tsunamis coming in 78 percent in 30 years, and they cannot escape from such a large tsunamis. So the only way that the community can survive in 30 years is to build a new, new, new development uh, up on the hill. So what it is really needed for pre-disaster recovery planning is the science base on the, the magnitude of the risks. So in, in trying to respond to the first question um, on the COVID uh, impact, we, are, we have not been sure how much the magnitude of the, the, uh, the, this uh, infectious disease uh, be before, but now we are very much sure uh, this could give a tremendous impact to the to the uh, to the world. So we are probably in a position to start preparing for the disaster uh, pre-disaster planning for for infectious diseases diseases from now. Thank you, Raúl. Back to you. Thank you. Just uh, no, your responses uh, are really up opening uh, some larger discussions that will be complemented with all what is happening around the global platform. It's, of course, the reflection of, of building resilience after COVID-19 calls for a multi-sectoral response. And I think all the systems and what we think about the uh, pre-disaster recovery planning also requires this multi-sector approach. With this also, with type, this type of systemic thinking, Right, the systemic risk that originate cascade effects or consider mul multiple hazards happening at the same time is a challenge. But I think that we have what we have heard here is an excellent point for starting thinking about that future that we want, that resilient future that we all expect. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, one hour, of course, is not enough to cover such a broad subject. But I think we've had a very, very interesting snapshot of some great experiences from some countries that are heavily affected by natural disaster. Um, and I'd like to take, thank our uh, discussant first, Raul, for, for coming in from Panama, um, from that region. But also, I mean, we've listened to His Excellency the Minister from Fiji. Um, we've had experiences from Japan, uh, Cape Verde, uh, the Philippines, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, and really there's a lot we can learn. And I think this is the beginning of a dialogue about conversations and sharing experiences and best practices, um, which can always enhance uh, the country's uh, government's abilities to, to face disasters, but also to prepare for disasters and build better from disasters. We've had a lot of contributions 
um, particularly on how we can support sub-national and local government to plan and prepare for recovery before disaster strikes. <clears throat> and I would like to emphasize that point again, that planning uh, has to be at the national level, of course, um, hopefully supported by the UN and other partners, but we really need to decentralize um, plans to the local level. We've learned a lot about how we can build scalable uh, PDRP programs to train and support local governments, uh, which I hope can provide lessons about how we can deploy uh, and support similar programs elsewhere around the world. So to our panelists, uh, to His Excellency the Minister, thank you very much for your participation today. Uh, and as I said, in this uh, World Reconstruction Conference, there will be many more days now to actually share better experiences uh, on the global platform. Thank you very much to the organizers as well. Thank you from UNDRR. Thank you and good afternoon.